Hey everybody, welcome back to the Linux Cast. I'm your host Matt, and I'm Tyler. All right, so uh, this podcast feels like it almost never happened. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we've just had one problem after another getting this thing to stream. Hopefully, the recording actually ends up being okay. I mean, I'm gonna knock on some wood there. That should make Fingers editing the podcast crossed. better. <laughs> uh, but yes, we've been having some just amazing problems with OBS. I mean, it's like it just completely hates us for some reason. So I think we're there. I think we're there. If you're watching the video version, uh, you'll notice that I turned the light down. And I still look like a fucking vampire. All I need is some fucking sparkles. It's ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> how how can one white man be so white? It's like <laughs> I, I, it's, this is ridiculous. Um, I I don't understand the. I mean, is it not like a mixed ring light? Is it not like where you can change the temperature color of it? N well, you do it through cards, like pieces of card, like like. It was what? a $10 light on Amazon, bro. It was when I first started. I wasn't investing a lot of money, and I just haven't gone through and replaced it, because usually it's fine. Like, I can go through and make it brighter, but whoa! Now I'm even more of a vampire. Woo! All right, I'm going to turn that down a little bit. It's all right. So the, the video quality is is shit, but what else is new? Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, look, look. I, I believe everyone in chat can agree with a statement. Edward looks great over there. I believe that's the vampire from Twilight. <laughs> I can I honestly know. tell you that I have never in my entire life read Twilight or watched Twilight. I'm not a vampire guy. I don't understand vampires because Wait. they always cheat. Vampires can't be out in fucking sunlight. And it, those f idiots were frolicking in the fucking fields like... You you live in a house with females, yes? Yeah? Well, yeah, but they're way older than I am. Well, okay. Well, I mean, still though, like during the height of Twilight, I mean, like I was living in a house with women. Like I couldn't not watch Twilight was on like all the time. They made you watch the Notebook, didn't they? Oh, thank God, no. I was able to weasel out of that one. I, I was gonna say, it. if so, you poor, poor man, you need Doctor Phil's help because <laughs> he's uh, he's yeah, obviously no. the only one for the situation. If you had, uh, granted, the unfortunate thing didn't. I think he's friends with the guy who wrote the, the notebook, so chances are he's probably just going to make you read the book. <laughs> Art, Tw Art Center Twilight books for the best. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. So anyways, this is the Linux cast. We're like three minutes in or something like that. If you hadn't figured that out by now... You must be new. Welcome to the podcast. Mm -hmm. Welcome to subscribers all over the place, whether you subscribe to the audio or the video version. Welcome. Uh, this is the Linux cast. We talk about Linuxy things. Usually uh, we do so in a very organized fashion all the time. We're very highly organized. Oh. We've never been unorganized in our entire lives. Super professional. And if you well. believe I that, I have some oceanfront property to sell you in Arizona. <laughs> so, uh, and that just showed you that I like country music. Indeed, I do. I like I like all music, but that's a really old song and probably was sung before Tyler ever actually was born. So, anyways, <laughs> I'm sure it was. It probably was like actually it might have been the year you were born. Like whatever. Anyways, it doesn't matter. We talk about Linuxy things. So, Tyler, what have you been doing this week in Linux or OpenBSD? Apparently. I'm I'm glad I'm glad you put it like that, man. I am in OpenBSD and um, I've switched over. I'm using it on my Dell G5 laptop. My um, hallway mate book is actually what I'm running on now and what I'll keep work, uh, running on. My gigabyte uh, gigabyte brick server is the only thing in the house that's still running Linux. Uh, it's still just running my next cloud Docker in it. Um, my workstation is now OpenBSD. Everything uses OpenBSD now. Um, it's been really great. Um, I haven't really had any problems with it. Um, I've, I mean, I've thought something was broken when I just like didn't, didn't like, I needed reboot after setting some kernel parameters and different stuff like that um, that I just forgot about. But overall, it's been a great time. Um, Super great. Really loving my DWM rice that I did not too long ago. But yeah, uh, everything's going great. 
genuinely can't say anything bad. What about you? What you been up to? Well, so me, I have been thinking about switching back to Windows. Jesus, that bad? <laughs> Yeah, I, I did say that with a, with a straight face there for a second, but it didn't last for very long. You did. <laughs> All right, so Sunday, you and I got on the horn, and we were you were going to mm -hmm. teach me how to play Zero AD. We are going to stream it on my YouTube channel, which I don't know if you know, it's called the Linux Cast. You should subscribe. Um, <laughs> and we, we were going to play Zero AD, and you were going to teach me how because I'm a complete and utter noob. I've done, gone, done the tutorial, and that's literally it. And... You know, we got set up, we got the OBS thing started, and there was zero audio being uh, heard from OBS on your end. Like, it heard from me, and for whatever reason, and now at the time I was on Fedora, like I'm I'm in the middle of a Fedora long-term review, and uh, for whatever reason, the desktop audio, which should be an output source, like it's outputting audio to speakers and being captured midway through by OBS for whatever reason that was picking up the input from my microphone along with the input source from my microphone so I was getting two of me and there was zero of you and I was like well I mean you were there obviously but I was like well this is obviously a fedora problem I'm gonna log out and I'm gonna go to Garuda Garuda had the exact same problems and um, we, between you and me, we, we were both pretty much convinced that my computer was broken and I was going to need to spend thousands of dollars to replace it, or at least the motherboard. Not thousands, but you would at least need to replace the motherboard. Well, if I was, the thing is, is at one point I had all the stuff I wanted in my cart on, in a, on Amazon. Like I was, I was ready to pull the trigger on new hardware because I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I might as well replace that cheap fucking Chinese memory everybody goes after me about. And I'll get some good <laughs> Corsair stuff because it's that it's, memory is actually fairly decent right now. I mean, it's more expensive than yep. it used to be, but it's not like horrible. So I was like, you know, I'll get 64 gigabytes of top end uh, brand name memory. And I added a new Easy. water cooler and a new computer case because this computer case has no airflow. So I was like, you know, if I'm going to have to fucking rebuild it, I might as well just do the pieces that I'm unhappy right. with. Yeah. Came to a thousand dollars, and uh, then I said, "You want? Know I'm gonna just nuke and pave. I'm gonna nuke and pave and see if that fixes. I'm gonna go back to my beloved Arco, and lo and behold, it fixed it. Like I've had no problems with audio ever since. So, what we think happened is that both Garuda and Fedora use PipeWire as their audio source uh, system or whatever." So they most both must have just gotten a pipe wire update and it worked the system because after that I had left a message on the OBS forum and somebody said they were having the exact same problems and it was a pipe wire issue and downgrading it helped. So I guess if I downgraded to pipe wire I probably might not have had to nuke and pave but I'm actually kind of glad I did because I love Arco a lot. You should mm -hmm. buy the merch. Uh <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Good plug, good plug, so, yeah, professional so, plug. Yeah, exactly. Yep. It was good. Um, I think the 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 professionalism of the plug is diluted if you mention the plug after you've plugged. Um, <laughs> so it's like it's like having a good transition to something and then mentioning, "Hey, that was a good transition." It completely ruins the point. But anyway, <laughs> anyways, um, I'm glad that I did go back to Arco because I'm just I'm happier here. I'm very very much a comfortable person in Arco Linux. It just works for me. And I went through and installed all the window managers, like all of them, like <laughs> every single one. I have like 20 window managers on here, and I'm just a happy camper. I can switch every single day of the week and have some left over it's wonderful uh funnily enough you know, I still you know there are people screaming in chat bloat bloat i don't i don't, I, I don't care like it's perfect <laughs> why didn't you install vanilla arch linux you could have built it up from yourself well you want to know first of all i would just be using the graded installer for arch linux anyways and i always miss a package in arch linux like there's always like packages that i miss that just cause mm -hmm. things to break like there's things that you just have to install in order to get things to work and i always miss them so like for like two weeks after installing vanilla arch things are just wonky because i still have to continue to install i'm basically installing arch linux for three weeks mm -hmm. so yeah that's uh you would crack me up because you might be the type of I've seen this happen to so many people. So inside of the Arch like wiki, it doesn't tell you to install the headers 
for your kernel, but like most likely you're going to need them. So a lot of people just install the kernel and the firmware and yeah. then don't install the headers for it either. Yeah. Um, pull that in. Yeah. So I don't, I don't do vanilla arch that often. Like I, I did it the, the requisite first time and ran it for a long time uh, with LARBs, uh, you know, so uh, I ran, I have the nerd cred. I installed it. It's like it's there. Like I have the card and the T-shirt and all that stuff that says, "Hey, I installed Arch Linux." By the way, um, so <laughs> you know, I, I did that. But now I'm just I prefer Arco because it has all the packages that I need, plus like twelve thousand more. But it's okay. I, I'm used to. It. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy here. I didn't install Plasma, so I, I'm at least without the Plasma thing. But I did end up in. So I've been on the search for a new file manager and I'll, I have the file manager that I ended up choosing as a pick of the week next week. Um, but, uh, spoiler, it's crusader. Oh, it's so good. Oh man. Really? Yeah. It's so good. If you're a nerd, it's good. Like the only thing I've come across that I don't like about right now is that there's not a good way to preview images. And I think I'm just doing something wrong. Uh, but every time I've come up with something like, look, oh, this isn't very good. I found that there is a way of doing it. it. Just has a ton of different dependencies that are all that all start with the letter K. Uh, uh, weirdly enough, um, but man, okay. So here, here, it's a dual pane file manager by default. Like there's no way to turn the, the second pane off. Dream come true. I use du dual pane all the time. Never without that. It has tabs, uh, so you can go through and have tabs in both panes. I use the crap out of those. Like. I, I have more tabs in my file manager than I have workspaces on DWM. It's amazing. Yeah. It's so good. Um, and the best part, and this is the reason why I was switching away from Nemo, is that it remembers the tabs that you had open when it closes. So when you reopen them, when you reopen Crusader, it remembers them. It just brings it back up. All of them. Ooh. And you can pin tabs so that they're in the same position just in case you restart your computer and come back. Those tabs will open up again. It's fantastic now it's clunky as hell like it looks like it was designed for plasma three mm -hmm. like like it's yeah. it's pretty old looking well, it's, but it's not the oldest looking thing i've ever seen it's good and i'm happy with it if if i can figure out the image preview thing because there's supposedly an image preview thing i'm just assuming that i don't have the dependency that starts with the k um but anyways mm -hmm. that's so good that's what i've been messing around with also we talked about this in the pre-show six thousand subscribers on the channel absolutely oh, nuts oh. um so thanks Great. everybody who has subscribed it's just the, the channel's blowing up it's fantastic go subscribe to zany because he's like what you're not like 30 away from a thousand no i'm like i'm like less than 20 i'm, I'm over 980 right now. now all right so seriously go subscribe like seriously stop watching this go subscribe to his channel where it's like this close to a thousand subscribers I, i've been saying this now for like a month and a half he's so close go subscribe to his channel his con i mean he talked about chickens yesterday for like 15 minutes. It was great. Um, if that's not really the type of content you're interested in, you're more interested in, in Linux content, he does that too. Also, OpenBSD, also zero AD. So if you're into gaming, go, like, anyways, go uh, subscribe to his channel. I do channel. a lot of stuff over there. Yeah. He has he has no niche. He's just the the guy who does everything on his channel. So go, mm -hmm. go subscribe. It's awesome. Anyways, uh, side note, get him fired up on Microsoft and GitLab and he'll go on mm -hmm. for hours. It's great. So we tried GitLab. We moved our show notes to GitLab this week, Tyler. And I have to say this, okay. the the dark mode on GitLab is like like 10,000 times better than GitHub. Like it's actually yep. dark mode instead of blue. I mean, mm -hmm. who thinks that blue, I mean, literally the reason why you use a dark mode is to get rid of blue light and they decided that blue is the best color for a dark mm -hmm. mode. Who did this? Who's who's the designer? I want to talk to this person because they're obviously a fucking idiot. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> it's, it, it's it, and also just being able to edit the show notes. I mean, we were talking about this in the pre-show too. Like, oh, being able to edit the notes or the show notes with them is just so much better. Yes. Yeah, so for those of you guys who don't know, we used Notion before this. Like, Notion mm -hmm. is is a fine tool, but it's not meant for just two people. It's not meant for. Uh, people who aren't actually all that organized. <laughs> it just mm -hmm. felt like we were trying to put on shoes that weren't ours. Yeah. <laughs> Them is much more our speed. Um, so, uh, yes. Uh, we've had a lot of stuff happen the last week. So let's go ahead. And uh, now that we're like, I don't know, 21 minutes into the show. 
<laughs> do this do the contact information you can follow us on twitter at the linux cast you can subscribe to all of our audio feeds and stuff like that at the linuxcast.org as is usual and it's tradition i promise that that is eventually going to be a website i thought about starting it again this week but i obviously didn't think too hard about that uh, you can follow us or excuse me you can contact us via email email at the linuxcast.org you can support us on patreon at patreon.com slash linuxcast i highly encourage you to do so if you have any resources to spare because every once in a while you'll find that I go through and give my patrons early access to videos that I do and also you'll get the podcast an entire day early if you don't catch the live show so patreon.com slash linuxcast you can support zany by going to the links in the video description for odyssey and youtube you can also go through and check out the merch store which is actually zany's merch store um, but you can support both of us through that there. Um, uh, the store, awesome merch, all designed by Tyler. Uh, he's, you can tell that was designed by Tyler because if it was designed mm -hmm. by, by me, it would have been stick figures and stuff like that. I'm <laughs> not a designer at all. Anyway, neither can, am I. They yeah. just came out good somehow. It just well, even, better than me. <laughs> <laughs> we, should, we should have a design contest and you would have you would have won before you started anyways um you can also subscribe to us on youtube at youtube.com slash linuxcast uh like i said join everybody who's subscribed we have amazing com comments in on the videos that i do been doing and just been having some really good discussions there so uh, make sure you check that out so uh every week we go through and find news items that we find interesting that we'd like to talk about. So, Tyler, what is your news item of the week? Um, mine is that Linux is having a little security issue. Um, now, this is a, saying a little bit above my head would be kind of an understatement. I've read this thing about three times now, and I have a basic understanding of what's being said kind of um so apparently um as much as 38 percent of uh dns uh, of the internet's uh, dns servers are um vulnerable to uh, this new attack and it's the attack is essentially using um it exploits the lack of entropy, um, excuse me, so hold on. Hackers could exploit the lack of entropy um, by bombarding a DNS resolver with um, off-path off responses that include each possible ID. And then so essentially what happens is after that, people who are connected to the DNS um, would be sent to um, some malicious uh, destination mm -hmm. instead. Um, and so it's not really something that's going to be affecting like your home network, um, but bigger corporations are definitely at risk for this. Um, bigger, you know, home-based online companies and stuff like that. Um, you definitely want to look into this and um, investigate what you can do. Um, I will go ahead and say from reading this, from what I can tell, either all of Cisco's devices or most uh, of Cisco's devices are completely safe from this. So um, if you're using a, a, a Cisco DNS device, or whatever, uh, you should be safe here. Again, this is a very um, stupid person reading off a very intelligent article that I can kind of decipher. Yeah, most of that went completely over my head. Um... Like, I don't know what, I only vaguely know what entropy is, so. Um, but most of that, I think that knowledge comes from, like, science. Because that means entropy means something completely different in chemistry than it does mm -hmm. in in computer software. So, I, yeah. I, I think I'm probably mess, messing that up. Uh, th the interesting thing here to bring out is that um, Linux isn't, like, the most secure thing ever. And I think that sometimes people misconstrue that Linux is like completely secure and uh, you don't have to do anything. That's just not the case. Like not yeah. even a little bit. The well, I mean, Linux look, like an an OpenBSD is far more secure than um, uh, Linux. Well, it's, it's because it's like OpenBSD is like what ten thousand lines of code. I mean, 
<laughs> I mean, it's tiny compared to Linux. And Linux tiny. is like 5 million lines of code. So, of course, Linux is going to have bugs and flaws and security issues. I mean, it's just, it's just a fact of life. Now, compared to Windows, Linux is more secure. It's just not 100% secure because no operating system is 100% secure and no no operating system can be 100% secure because there's always assholes out there trying to find holes. Now, the good news about this, at least from what I can tell, is that um, we know about it now and, and it can be fixed. So um, that's probably a good thing that we know about it. And it's not just uh, some only the bad guys know about it. So that's good news. Um, but, I mean, this is not going to be it's not the first time that Linux has had this kind of flaw and it's not going to be the last. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's going completely 180 to something that really truly matters and could <laughs> spell the ruin of a lot of computers to something that matters nothing at all. Um, Steam. Wrong scene. There we go. Anyways, uh, Steam has announced that Steam OS 3.0 will be available for everyone to download and install. Uh, and I find this very cool because this is basically an Arch-based distro that is running SteamOS on top of it as a distro or a desktop environment, and it's built on top of KDE Plasma. So that's cool. Also, the supposedly the file system will be immutable, so it'd be something like Silverblue. I don't know if there's an Arch-based distro out that has an immutable fi uh, file system. Like I'm not sure if I'm sure there I'm sure there's one that exists. I've just never heard of one. Um, that's really cool. Um, and it's really interesting. It'll be interesting. I, I'm going, definitely going to install this on a machine. Although the machine that I'd probably install it on probably wouldn't be capable of actually gaming anything. But it'll be interesting to install it and see how it goes. Because it's it's very interesting. Yeah. I, I'm very... I'm very nervous with them deciding to use Pipewire for it. Oh, God. Um, yeah, I didn't... I, look, look, I see a bright future ahead for Pipewire. But whatever they shit with that Steam Deck, it has to be fucking ready for print. Like, let's get let's get down to brass tacks, boys. If they release this Steam Deck and it and whatever they choose software wise is not ready to back up that fantastic hardware, if it's not ready for prime time, we are fucked. Because the Steam Deck is really what could drive a lot of younger people to start choosing Linux and get them developing for Linux a lot younger and and if it comes out and reviews yeah. are shit rough totally agree and it, it pipewire is not ready yet it's just pipewire is not ready yet it's it, it's right. not it's it's not there and you can't test this is not the t type of distro slash hardware that you can test something that's not ready yet on you have to have dedicated people who are uh I was gonna say like me, but I'm just a nuke and pave guy. If it goes wrong, I'm nuke and paving. If I can't fix it, but you, so you need people who are actively interested in the development of Pipeware to test that stuff, and that can't be done on the pipe on the on the Steam Deck. I completely agree. It's just same thing with Wayland. It's just it's not ready yet. Um, mm -hmm. but hopefully, hopefully they know what they're doing. You know, but hopefully, I, I'm yeah, I'm really I'm really worried about the pipe the. Seriously though, audio on Linux is horrible all the time. So I mean, I'm using Pi I'm using Pulse Audio, and we just spent like a half an hour trying to get my audio working. So um, I I can't really say that Pulse Audio is like the best either. But when Pulse Audio works, it works very well. Uh, it's just when it you know breaks, then you have problems. But I don't know. It's gonna. The thing is about Valve is they have support systems. So when things go wrong, they should be able to have. Uh, somebody I mean they've got the money behind it so. yeah um what worries me though is that that support system will be in a call center staffed by somebody who's you know earning minimum wage and has only the technical knowledge to uh, read the manual um mm -hmm. that's not I don't think that Linux can be supported very well out of a manual like a like not a person to person the person who's doing the support has to have some knowledge so hopefully uh, they've sorted that out. Uh, but I don't know, mm -hmm. um, because like when you call Microsoft, the person on the other end doesn't know anything about Windows. They're just reading mm -hmm. out of the book. You no, know? like that. That's why I'm always amazed by people who do call Microsoft support. Like, why? Like, 
you're literally calling someone who doesn't know anything about the problem just like you don't like you know more about your problem than that person you're gonna have to explain it to them and the resources they have at hand are only slightly better than the ones that you can find in two minutes on google well, just because what they're using is 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 basically help desk that has mm -hmm. uh, all the problems that could poss that they've ever had or that, or that they have solutions to the, the problems are listed and then they click on a link and it takes them to the solutions to that problem. If you're having a problem that's not on their list of problems that they've had before, you're not going to get a solution. Uh, and exactly. like I said, that's the probably going to be the issue with kind of uh, supporting Linux through that way. Um, it'd be interesting. I mean, I'm very fascinated by this, the stream deck and the stream OS because this is going to be Linux on the scale of something we've never really seen before. Like this, they've sold millions. I'm, we think we've they've sold millions of these things, mm -hmm. and it's going to be sold to people who just are not used to using Linux. Uh, so the support for that is just going to be. I mean, I would not want to be. <laughs> I would not want to work for that support team well, at I mean, all. Like I mean, screw the support team. Even if you're not going to be giving out like that type of support, like shit just better work. Like if you're going to choose Pipewire, you better make sure that you're using your own, like your only slight, like your slightly uh, behind branch of Pipewire that you know works. Um, I mean, the, the advantage here is it's just one piece of hardware. The The only thing that changes by model is the storage size mm. or type. So <clears throat> on that front, they're pretty, it's pretty easy going. You just have to make sure that things work on that piece of hardware, but it has to, it has to work very good and it cannot get an update that breaks shit. That, that cannot happen. Uh, your PlayStation doesn't get an update where the audio stops working. Like your hit, like your Game Boy Advance never got updates that broke it. Like, that can't happen. Uh -oh. Yeah. Hopefully it won't. It's going to be very interesting. All right. So uh, that's the news for the week. Um, usually, usually we have more fun things to talk about, but we chose uh, security problems uh, to talk about for the watch. <laughs> There's not much happy, happy that we can talk about there. So let's moving on to the main topic. So Tyler, this was your main topics. Are snaps and flat packs really the future? So take us, take us away. Would you? Okay, yeah. Um, so I know Dylan's going to heavily disagree with me in chat about this. Um, I'm sure most people are going to disagree with me on this, but I don't think snaps and flat packs or even app images are necessarily the future. Um, I, I think app images are the best out of the three. Um, however, uh, I mean, we've talked about it before, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it now in more in depth. But uh, s the actual snap daemon, not necessarily snaps themselves, but the snap daemon is terrible. It's just, I mean, if it was a person, like it wouldn't have any friends. That's <laughs> literally how it would go. Um, flat packs are all right. Um, I don't really have any problems with flat packs. Um, they they're they're not really slow or anything, um, but I think distributing all of these things is really kind of I think it's going to slide into obscurity after a while. I think they're going to get more and more popular, like snaps and flat packs. I, I think I think they'll explode, get very popular, but then they will slide into obscurity in the community, uh, mainly due to things like Rust. Like I've been getting more into Rust. Um, Rust is fantastic. Uh, Rust has cargo. And so if you write your application using Rust, um, I like me being an open BSD user, you might distribute your software with binaries for different distros, but as long as it's written in Rust, using Rust, I can get I can use cargo and install your application for my completely separate operating system. S super simply. I don't need any real technical knowledge at all. As long as Rust has been ported over to my OS, it works. Uh, I don't really know that these will actually get to be um, that popular in the long term. 
Okay, what so you- I, I have many, many thoughts on this question. So if I had the... T- if I were in charge, if I was the grand poobah of the Linux, you know, the Linux, um, mm-hmm. I would, my choice for package management would obviously be the AUR. Um, if, if, if we could just make it so that the AUR was distro agnostic and was on every distro, that would be the best thing we could do for package management. It just, it's so good. Now... Obviously, the AOR has its own problems, but if you expand it to across distros, maintaining it and curating it and moderating it would be easier because there'd be more people. So the AOR would be my personal choice, but that's not going to happen. I mean, it's just it's it's not. So that's as as sad as that is. We have to deal with some other things because we a universal package manager is a good idea. It just, it is a good idea. We have too many package managers on Linux. We just do. I mean, we add in, we have apt, we have Pacman, we have, you know, EO package on Solus. We have, you know, DNF and zipper and cargo and pip. And, and there's 12,000 different package managers out there, depending on what you're installing. And it's a, absolutely, it's an absolute mess. So a universal one that works across t- distros is a good idea. Where we've diverged and as where we always diverge in the Linux community is what the idea f- solution for that problem is because everybody's has different ideas. So we've created three main solutions to the problem, snap, flat packs, and app images. Snaps are God awful. They're proprietary garbage mm-hmm. and uh, they put shit in your home directory that you don't want to be there. I'm I- I'm sorry, Dylan. That's just the way it is. Um, I mean, I mean, you're, you're, uh, to me, you're even taking it easy. You didn't even mention the fact that it puts a shitload of loop devices in there. Uh, the fact that it's slow, um, but yeah, you know, I, I can deal with the slow. Like I understand it, 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 it's bad that they're slow and I think that they can fix that. And I think they can fix the other problems too, but the problem is that they won't. Okay. It, It just, it just. That, snap, that that putting a snap directory in your home directory has been a problem and has been a filed bug f- since the beginning of snap it has not been fixed. Okay, now supposedly they're working on it, but they've been working on it for years. I'm not holding my breath. And I understand this. Oh, that's such oh, a... S- co- no, 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 no. Don't you even dare try and take it easy on them. Working on it, bro. Like where you put a folder on my hard drive there is no way that is something that is like moving earth and like traveling to hell and back again now, to you, get you'd done i think it would be just changing the directory paths in whatever code they're using you'd think that that's all it would be right but i yeah. don't know whatever let's just assume that it's harder than we think it is whatever and i, I like i said i understand that that's such a small thing to care about like most people they don't care like I mean, most normal people they don't care, but I care. You know, like you know, like the, the the I'm not I can't speak for other people. I care about that, um, and 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 it bothers me. Like like why can't I I like fine put it there, but allow me to move it. Anyways, it doesn't matter. I I bet you about that all the time. Uh, the the main problem with snaps overall is that the back end is proprietary. It's owned by Canonical and it's not open source like at all. And they don't want to open source it. They want it to be proprietary and that's not when you're talking about creating a universal package system for across distros you can't have that to be controlled by one corporation even if it's like open source it and be the main contributor to it sure like ubuntu is fine and it's mostly majority controlled by canonical but it's open source you know i mean people can base stuff off from it people can go in and audit the code all that stuff um so it being supported by a company or one single company is not a bad thing, but when that company is keeping it proprietary and controlling it, for example, let's just say replace micro replace canonical with Microsoft. Let's say Microsoft was the one that had created the snap package or snap D would we be okay with them keeping snap D proprietary and then offering packages to be distributed through their system uh, across Linux. Like the answer to that is, no, we wouldn't because, I mean, yes, we tr- we trust Canonical more than we trust Microsoft, but the scenario is exactly the same. We've just substituted the companies. So that's the biggest and problem with snaps. 
Yes, and I do agree with you. And some people, like Dylan in chat, might say, but you can now run your own snaps. So most snaps are not... All right, most people are not ha hosting their own snaps, okay? Most people are not. And that, I mean, that's really not even the point. Like, um, it's just... It's, snaps are just not great. Uh, yeah. I... And Canonical also shouldn't be... If we're being honest, if you want any um, FOSS company or organization to be the leader of uh, cross-platform applications, it's probably not Canonical. Like, out of all of the ones that you would pick, Canonical is probably the last one. I, I have nothing against Canonical. I, I just don't think that... Just make it open source. Be, be in control of it. I don't care. Like, I, I'm okay with it. Just make it so it's open source. Like, it... it, it the reasoning behind it has always been something like, oh, well, we don't want everybody to be able to fork this because then we're just going to have a, a repeat of the PPA system where everybody was able to have their own PPA and nothing was maintained and there's security problems like that. That was That's the reason behind it. It's a reasonable thing. But it always has felt to me that there's more behind it. Like, there's just always has felt like there's... I mean, I don't want to say it's shady. I don't think it's shady. I just think that there's more behind it. Like, they want that control that proprietary software gives them. And that worries me a bit. Because if this was any other project, you know, fine. But this is something that you're trying to do for distros across all, all of Linux. If this was just for Ubuntu, whatever. Ruin your own distro, I don't care. But this is something that we're... The purpose behind Snaps, or at least the purpose I feel behind Snaps is for a cross-platform package manager. But that's... Maybe that's not the way they look at it. Maybe they look at it like, this is just for Ubuntu. Other people can just use it. And uh, we can do whatever we want with it because we're only writing it for our people. You know, maybe that's the way they look at it. So uh, before I move on, um, I'm going to... I'm, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna just not even try. I would. I'd butcher. Shh. Yeah. Tyler, can you pronounce that name? <laughs> no. Okay. I. I know I can't. I. I'm gonna pr pr pronounce your last name, Actar. Okay. I, I just messed up your your first name, and it, it'd be embarrassing to both of us. Anyways, you say of the three, App Image is the best or the least bad, not best. I think we as a community should promote universal package managers like. Uh, geeks and neeks um the, the i know distro tube Jeffrey tried those um but i'm not sure if those are something that uh like a new user would be able uh, they'd have to be more new user friendly i think right I, i've never used them so i, I literally cannot comment on those like i've all. only i've i've only seen the videos on it so i've never tried i know everybody's trying to get me to do nix os uh as a video but i haven't got around to it yet so um, eventually I will, but like I said, I, from what I've been able to see, those aren't necessarily the most new user, but that doesn't mean that they can't be, you know, if enough people got behind them. Um, anyway, like, I don't know. So snaps, I don't think I agree are the future. I, uh, in, unless they go through and solve that open source problem, I don't think they're the future. Now, flat packs on the other hand. I like flat packs actually. I actually do like them quite a lot, but they have the problems. Uh, the user interface for flat packs isn't nearly as good. Um, now they do have Flat Hub, and they ha if you go to Flat Hub and you find a random package and you scroll down and the the, the little command to install that flat pack is something like flat pack flat hub install com dot spotify dot whatever. Like that's not. <laughs> That's not great. Like, yeah, like just it's not a great name, right? Just replace. I mean, seriously, we have aliases for a reason. Just alias the name of the package that com dot whatever to flat pack. Now, apparently, you can do that, but that's not the way it appears on the website. So people just assume that that's the way you're supposed to do it, and you know, so that's not great. Uh, I have I, flat packs do seem to be faster. Uh, they don't install stupid things in your home directory. And they are open source. So uh, it takes care of the three problems I had with Snaps. The problem is if you're against corporate influence, um, both neither of these are going to be an option because one's 
canonical, one's Red Hat. So um, if you're against those things, uh, Red flat packs aren't going to be for you either. Um, personally, I'm okay with a little bit of corporate influence. I'm of the mind that you can't have open source software without money, and corporations have the money. So, um, the the, but I don't think enough. I don't think that flat packs are going to have enough of an adoption to gain any traction, just because they're not. Uh, as I mean, unfortunately, as slow as hell snaps, I think will take over the market. I, yeah. I truly believe they will because Ubuntu will make them the standard. And then there's so many Ubuntu based distributions that the general casual, as we say, newbie uh, Linux community will start demanding snaps. And we'll, we'll just, I mean, just the industry standard will become snaps for normal people. Yeah, I, I, that's why I wish they'd make them better. Just, just like, yeah. make them better, make them open source. Uh, that's the thing about open. If you made them open source, maybe somebody in the community could help make them better. You know. Mm -hmm. Um. So I, I don't. It, it's. I know the people who are behind snaps are always upset when people go after the fact that they're not open source. Like we have a good reason. Like we have a good reason. Like. You know what. People who do, you know, bad things almost always think that they have good reasons. And I'm not saying that Canonical is doing something bad, obviously, but the road to, to hell is always paved with good intentions. Uh, yep. And that's the reason behind open source software is that when you open source something, your intentions are in in broad daylight. People can go through and see what you're doing. And it doesn't look like you're hiding something. Now, like I said, I don't think Canonical is actually hiding anything with snaps. It just... It's open source, or it's, or it's not open source. So how would you know? You know, how mm. would you know? Um, so hopefully that they, they think. Now let's talk about app images because the of the three, the, these are the most interesting, and also the ones that I actually dislike the most. I don't like oh, app really? images at all. Um, and like, similar to snaps, it's for a, a, a stupid reason. Uh, if you Google, how do I install a snap or an app image? You'll get, while well, you go into the your file manager where you downloaded it from, you right-click on it, you change the permissions to enable execution, and then you click on it and you run the application. Yeah. For uh, user-friendliness, that's not a great experience. Um, also reminds me a lot of downloading an .exe file from Windows, so I'm having flashbacks every time I do it. Um, but also... Does that mean every time I have to go through and run a, an app image that I have to go into my file manager and double click on that icon? <laughs> um, and the answer to that seems to be pretty much yes, unless you know how to create a .desktop file and put it into your path. Um, that's not a good, <laughs> like that's not a, an option for a person who just came from Windows and started using Linux. It's just, that's not an option. Nobody knows how to do that. I'm not sure I could do it well. I don't think I've ever done well, it, so... The funny thing is, is the way that app images are supposed to work, most people don't do that. For one, the reason I like them is exactly the reason you hate them. Um, I like them because for a lot of people, when they switch over to Linux from Windows, app images are perfect because it's just like EXEs. You just got to make them executable and then run. Um, well, the, I mean... the way app images are supposed to work is you're supposed to have an applications folder in your home directory called well, capital A application, drop that shit in there. And then there are GUI applications that will read that folder and have your app images there, sort of like a software center, or whatever like that. But you can actually like run all of your applications from there. Yeah, but that's not default, right? You have to have a, an application that is meant to find that folder. And like if you're just r running Rofi, it's not going to find them. No matter, I mean, unless you have it in in uh, the applications folder in your user directory, then it will find it. But then you also have to have a .dot desktop folder. As far as I'm aware, now you got to remember, Linux noob here, so it's possible that I'm just doing it wrong. It's completely possible. But the thing you mentioned about .dot exe is when you download a .dot exe on Windows, usually what that .dot exe is, it's leading to an installer. Okay, yeah. almost yeah. universally. So. I, it'd be completely different if you clicked on that application and then it installed it. Like, it, it, 
handed it like a script or something and it moved it to the where it needs to be moved the binary where it needed to be and then you could go through and launch it just like any other program and it's fine like i i've installed i've downloaded app images like everybody has before but i most always it's a one purpose application it's one time use i go in there i'm only going to use that application one time it's usually for a video or something and then i never do it again because it gets lost in my downloads folder where i have three gigabytes worth of nonsense that i've downloaded over the last year you know what i mean Wait. The, Wait, hold on. But like, my solution to that like argument would be, well, again, like the way app, app images are distributed, again, it's not really like there's a driving force behind distributing app images. App images essentially work or are supposed to be working under the same guise as DXEs. But I, I guess what we could do just as a community is start just writing guides and telling people to just take your app images name them something if, if, if they come with a stupid name from the download well shame on that software to um like maker but um name them something good just drop them in uh, like an app images folder like a hidden dot app images folder and just add that to your path okay I, i'm i'm listening to you and as a uh, as a user of linux who's been using linux for a while i knew everything you said there and how to do it um, random okay. window user doesn't know how to do that. And you said, well, let's write guides. Well, we have written guides and they all are, all are exactly what I said. Go into your file explorer, change it to that exe or, you know, uh, executable and then click on the icon. That's how you're supposed Now, some desktop environments do this correctly. Like if you're using plasma and you, or at least in some distros and you double click on a app image, you'll say, do you want to install this thing? Uh, and you can click yes. And that's how it should work. It moves it to where it's supposed to supposed to do it. You can then access it from the menu like you should. Dylan, I saw your question. Who's going to use Rofi? Rofi was just an example. App images don't show up in like uh, any menu system unless they're in a, in their appropriate places because it's not your 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 menu system doesn't know that your app image is located in your downloads folder or wherever it's supposed to be. Yeah. It, it just doesn't. You have to move it to some places, and that's my point is that app images require a level of user interaction that no other app package does, whether it's you're talking about your standard package manager, whether you're talking about snaps or flat packs. Once you've installed, those things install. Like, yes, they require a certain syntax and a certain way of doing things and a certain way of learning. That's true. But once you've installed them, you launch the application just like you launch whatever application. You, you, you want your web browser you go to your menu, you hit Firefox, it launches. You, you go to your your, brow, your menu system, you find the app image or the package that you installed, it launches. With app images, that's not how it works by default. You, you, you've explained to me where you have to do these, this step and this step and this step. And maybe that that step, those steps that you have to take is kind of anag analogous to installing a snap or something. It's the, It's... Yes, they all have steps, and maybe those are the steps for app images, but those steps just feel dumb to me. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, it's just it, they're, it, they're they're not they're not new user friendly. Um, I don't like think they they are new user friendly as long as you don't want to keep using the app. Like if you want to keep using the app for long term, yeah. Uh, it, it, I I do agree with you. We, we do essentially need like either. Um, I mean, we really need the developers of app image to go a step further and essentially create like an app image daemon that's going to manage app images for you. Or, or literally, I mean, something, or maybe everyone inclu includes a script or something that, you know, installs it properly. Or just have it be like whatever that, I think it's Plasma that does that, where, where, you, where you click it once it's executable, it offers install it for you. That's literally the only step that I would ask them to take is to have it be installed so that when you want to use it again, you don't have to go spelunking into your downloads folder to try to find what it is. So, for example, I went through and I paid for a year of Deezer premium music subscription because it was, a, you know, it was a good deal. I got it for like, a, you know, 60 bucks or something. It was a good deal. Um, and so I canceled Spotify and moved to that. Deezer has a... Or, I mean, somebody created a Deezer application for Linux. I was like, that's great. I'm going to use it. Problem is, it's only distributed through app images, right? So I have an app image somewhere in my downloads folder 
for this Deezer app, which I can never find and never even remember that I have. Uh, and the only way for me to launch it is to go to my file explorer and launch it from there. Um, now, I understand there are steps that I could use to do it, but I don't want to take those steps because that would defeat the purpose of using an app image. If it, it feels, I don't know. It's weird. I mean, I, I, I do agree with you. Um, I mean, it, it, it's also weird because these, these containerized like, um, distro agnostic ways of distributing software. Like they, they are, they have a lot of benefits, but they do also have their cons. Um, a good example of this is these, like the idea of sandboxing um, all of your software. It like for some reason it creates like this fanatic way of looking at your system. It's honestly stupid as hell. Um, where people want to containerize everything on their system, like that's what VMs are made for. Why would you want to? Why do I want to have? every single application that I run containerized. That's that's stupid. That's so dumb. Um, and then it also leads to people wanting crazy things containerized, like your init system. Like, why? What? What are you doing? Like, yeah. I, I don't know. I, 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 like, I like that they exist, but I don't like the idea of them becoming the standard. Uh, so I I can understand the idea of wanting most of your applications, like the user-facing applications that you use on a daily basis to be containerized. Like I can understand because from a security standpoint, if the applications can't act, interact with each other or the operating system all that much, they become more secure, right? In theory. The, the problem with the Linux community, and I know we talk about this a lot, is that we do things in nine different ways. And yeah. sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's not a good thing. And in this case, I don't think that we've done a very good job of explaining why containers are a good thing. But also, we haven't done a good job of explaining why one way of containerizing something, snaps, are, are, is better or worse than you know other, another way of containerizing something like flat packs or app images. And... The, the issue becomes when you're a new user, you've just switched away from Windows and you've inst you, you, you've gotten past the hard part. You've burned your ISO, you've got past UEFI and you've installed Ubuntu and it, you're looking at that glorious purple and orange butt cheek right on the front of <laughs> your, your wallpaper. You know, it's it's glorious. There's icons along the side. There's, you know, it's it's great. You're You're a Linux user. Now you have to go through and install an application. And so you go to the application store. That's what you do. And the issue here is that that's all anybody ever should have to do is go to their application store. If you're a new user, you don't give a shit about snaps or flat packs or app images. You're never going to – chances are you're never going to know what the hell those things are. Uh, you're not going to know that every time you install an application from the Ubuntu store that you're actually installing a snap. You're not going to know that until you get like really technical into Linux. You're just installing yeah. Steam or you're just installing whatever. So uh, the answer to which one of these these things is going to win is mostly irrelevant because most or at least it's mostly relevant to new users, I should say, because most of them are never going to interact with any of them anyways. They're going to install from a store like they install everything else. Um, so uh, the real question is going to be how you make the things that those stores interface with, like snaps or flat packs, better um, to be, you know, so they aren't actually horrible things. Um, no. So. Well, I mean, like, Yes, the, the the method of distribution for them needs to. That is essentially what makes them good. Like snaps and flat packs wouldn't be nearly as good if they didn't have the solid, easy method of distribution that they do now. Yeah. Um, but I mean, look, I don't think using a lot of snap packs or snap flat packs or snaps. You, you were going to say idea. snack packs. I know you, you were talking yep, about. You were yep, going to say snack packs. Yep. 
<laughs> I, they... I don't think it's a bad idea to use a lot of them. The bad thing about them is is we don't. I mean, the idea that everything should be installed as a snap pack doesn't really make sense. There's a. Um, I, I I really think a lot of people need to be educated on like what needs what needs access to things and what doesn't. Um, like. Yeah, it's probably beneficial to have your browser containerized, of course, because browsers are hella like unsecure, um, and that's a method of attack. Like Discord being containerized, Steam being containerized, it's probably a great idea. But having Vim or Nano run as a snap is stupid. Um, like there, there are just things that um, being containerized doesn't make sense for, and. Um, like like GIMP is a good example. Like sure, sure, uh, GIMP might be able to do something nefarious behind the scenes, but let's be real, it's GIMP. Like it it, it is a foundational piece of software that tons of people use, tons of people in the community develop for. Um, if there was something malicious being added into GIMP, somebody would notice. Like. I mean, it's not like GIMP is something that barely gets updates or barely has any development behind it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, again, fi finding out like where to use containers is probably just as valuable as figuring out how to make um, getting containers and uh, making them appealing and easy to use for everybody. All of that has to be just as important. Because no, no, I, I don't want to live in the world where most people are running system D uh, in a snap. Like, n no, I, I, I don't even want to. Why? I want to find the person how? who makes that possible and, and, and just ask them how they did it because it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. All right. So uh, what I was talking about earlier about the, the whole store thing, it, it brings up another point because we're something I mean, we can ignore all the pro inherent problems with snap. Uh you know, out of the box that they have. We can just just, just, just discount all that stuff. Because, mo like I said, most people, when they interact with Snap on Ubuntu or, Ubuntu, you know, Ubuntu flavors, they're just installing from a store. But where Snap and Flatpak falls down is when you use that method of installing outside of the distro they were made for. So, like, if you, you install a Flatpak from the Fedora GNOME store... You don't know you're installing anything from Flatpak, but if you install Flatpak from Arch, you know you're interacting with Flatpak yeah. because you're installing it from the terminal. The same thing happens with Snap. If you're using Snap on Arch, there's a good chance you're installing that from a terminal interface. Now there are some GUI, you know, interfaces for interacting with Snaps and Flatpaks on Arch, of course, uh, but there's no longer the the, like the mediator between you and the actual snap when you're using snap or flat pack on a different distro than what it was intended to be used for. So uh, I would actually have to argue with that with you on that one. I, I think your point's valid, but I don't think arch is made for someone who uh, needs a software center or does like you know doesn't want to know where they're pulling their software from Arch um, like i was using kde neon and i could install snaps and flat packs from the software center there yes i, I did know i was installing them fine like, manjaro then you know well in manjaro you have your software center where you can pull flat packs from don't you yeah but by default i believe it pulls from the arch repositories not flat packs. You have to choose, go in to choose in the, in the settings to choose to pull from flat pack or snaps. Well, it may also be that thing that, you know, elementary was doing where you have to like go to flat hub and like click install there. And then it magically will appear and pull in all of that stuff, stuff from flat hub. But still, I mean, so the point is once you move away from Fedora or Ubuntu, you're much closer to interacting with actual snaps and flat packs. And that's where things fall down a little bit because it's not as, as much as a more, it's not as polished of a user experience for that. And maybe that's where the argument is that 
these aren't really meant to be cross-platform, cross-distro package managers. They're meant just to be containerized packages for Ubuntu or for Fedora or Red Hat. You know, maybe that's what they were initially intended to be, and then they kind of morph into this whole cross-platform distro, cross, you know, package management system that people kind of want. Because, um, I mean, people do want a cross-platform, cross-distro package management system. It, it's not a gr great experience, unless you're on Arch and have the AUR, which is what you should use all the time. Uh, if course. you're on like Debian or something, snaps and flat packs are great, whichever one you choose, because sometimes the Debian repo is just horrible. I mean, it's it's a it's mm -hmm. doesn't have all the software. They're the software is a lot of times out of date. I mean, it has its purpose, and there's a reason behind those things, but it's still true. So sometimes snaps and flat packs can make that experience better. Same thing if you're on something like uh, Solus. Solus doesn't have a lot of software in the repositories, so having snaps or flat packs there makes a ton of sense. Uh, yep. The only distro that doesn't make, I mean, the only distro that doesn't make a lot of sense on is Arch or Arch-based distros because you have the UR. And even on Arch, like I do that five top five Linux apps of the month every month, and mm -hmm. almost without question every single month there's at least one application there that's just not in the AUR. like this mm -hmm. time there was one called uh, i think it was called markets that i did wasn't in the AUR, so i had to go through and install the flat pack and you know that was fine it made me feel kind of dirty but you know <laughs> it's good that i had the option to install it from flat pack what worries me is that we're getting to a point where we have several different places where software can be put. Like you you distribute your software in certain places. Like say you decide you rewrite an application and you're distributing it as a snap. That's all you're ever going to distribute it as, as a snap. That forces people then to use snap. Like if you want that application, you're going to have to go use a snap. That's the same argument I have against elementary OS, which always wants to have things developed for elementary OS instead of for Linux. You know, yeah. so what's really going to end up happening here, because we have five or 10 or 12 or million different package managers, is that when you want an application, you're going to have to have all these package managers on your system in order to go and find an application that you want. So that means... Uh, you for the first you're on Arch. The first thing you're gonna do is search the AUR because of course you are. That's what you can do. And when that mm -hmm. fails, if it does fail, you're gonna to have to go through to the website and say, "Hey, where can I find this application?" And it's gonna be well, this one's gonna be snapped. The next application that you come across that's in the same you know scenario, you're gonna well, well, this one's from Flatpak. So you're gonna if you do a Neo fetch on my system right now, it says four thousand packages or whatever it is. You know, it says remember I installed all those window managers. Yep. In parentheses, this is going to say seven snaps, 12 flat packs. And all this is doing, well, instead of having just one cross platform package manager, all it's done is made our systems entirely too messy for my, for my, you know, it's just make it, if you have OCD, you're in trouble because worst. now all of a sudden you have packages from, multiple different sources that you have to keep track of. Uh, hopefully they all update with just your regular update things, but who knows if that will always be the case. And uh, then you have to remember where certain things were installed. So like if you, like a year from now, you're still using the same Linux install and you want to install this program, you have to remember what package manager you use to install it. Uh, and So you have to go through the process of figuring that out. So it's, it adds all this horrendous c complexity to the package management systems which we i mean which was already unreasonably complex but when it was without when we didn't have snaps flat packs or app images and all we had was the distros uh package ma you know manager at least that's all you had to worry about you know if you're on arch all you had to worry about was pacman if you're on debian or ubuntu all you had to worry about was apt and what you installed with that now there's four or five different ones that you have to worry about and it, it adds a ton of of you know mess mm -hmm. that was a really it also good makes point, explaining Matt. your system yeah i mean it, it makes explaining your system to someone else super difficult like 
like when you're like, oh yeah, but I've got like four four snaps on here. You're like, what snaps? And you're like, well, I've also got these flat packs. What's well, what's the difference between those two? And it's like, well, and getting someone who's new to Linux explained to all of the different complexity of choice is always a difficult thing. Um, hopefully, though, a lot of people understand. Like, look, there's a lot of shit to learn. It doesn't mean you have to learn it all. Okay. If you don't learn anything about snaps or anything for the rest of your life, you'll be fine. It's okay. Yeah. All right. So, holy shit, man. We're an hour and 12 minutes into this podcast. <laughs> we haven't made it to the picks of the week yet. So, we're going to do that really quick, and then we're going to get out of here because I've got to get out of this chair. I've been sitting here for way too long today. i got to get up and move around. All right. So, Tyler, every single week we go through and we scour the internet for you know, interesting apps, picks, things that we want to share with our audience. So Tyler, why don't you tell us about your pick of the week this week? My pick of the week is Cargo. Um, it's a Rust tool for installing Rust applications, and it's fantastic. Um, you're going to use Cargo, and it essentially is going to pull uh, a Rust package down, compile it uh, on your system, and um, you know, install it, which is, it's super, it's super great. Um, first time you install a package, it'll tell you, hey, you need to add the dot .cargo path or folder to your path. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it's a super easy way of um, installing applications, uh, as long as they're Rust applications, but it works on, you know, the great thing about it is it makes, it's sort of like snaps and flat packs on crack, because you can install a package on OpenBSD, like whatever different operating system you're on, as long as Rust is and Rust and Cargo are ported over to it, you're good to go. Oh, good. Well, we needed another package manager. Good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right. So my pick of the week this week is an oldie buddy goodie. Uh, so something you might not know about me is that um, I'm not very good at SSH. I'm not, like the first time I SSH did into something was like 2000 like 9 or so when I was SSHing into an iPhone like 3G in order to jailbreak it. Uh, and after that I didn't use SSH for ages. So I had no clue how to SSH on Linux until like this last week. So if you go to like GitHub and search for how to create an SSH key and lose SSH with GitHub, their instructions are horrendous. They're like really, really bad and really convoluted and stuff. So I had no, like I followed those things and it just did not work. So that's the reason why I sought out something like Gitkraken, where you know Gitkraken just allows you to sign into your GitHub account and you can push pull and stuff, all that stuff you need to do from there without having to deal with SSH. But when we decided to use GitLab this for our show notes, I looked up into their their uh, um documentation for learning how to do ssh and it was god it was so simple it was like how did i not know yeah. how to do this it was like this is so easy like it, it made me realize two things first of all ssh is really easy you should definitely uh use it for mm -hmm. git uh it's very very simple also the github documentation is fucking awful it's just so Dude, bad, I mean, so bad. like there, there's a lot of it but it's just really bad i don't know who wrote it it was like it's like, just not a good experience at all and we can't even blame microsoft because i'm pretty sure the documentation was worse or, yeah. or bad when they were just a private company so uh yeah uh ssh is my pick if you're using git use ssh because it's really actually uh really good i mean um wait how are you using ssh with git well you just add a ssh key to your GitLab. And then you, after, because you obviously have created that SSH on your computer. And then all you have to do is do your Git pushing and it asks you for your passphrase. That's it. I didn't even know you had to set up anything with SSH to be able to. I, I didn't set up anything with SSH to Git push up to. Uh, You're probably uh, just GitLab. using your GitLab account then. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, you, you, oh, you're, oh, you're using SSH keys. Got you. I know. Yeah, like, like you're not oh, supposed because you're not supposed to like and I get let I get hub. You can't use your account anymore, uh, to to do to do anything with Git. You have to have either an API key or you have to use SSH. Um, and the 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 API key is like twenty or thirty digits long, and you, so it kind of defeats the purpose <laughs> for me. Is so uh, I always just use GitLab or Git Kraken, but with with uh, now that I have SSH, I just have a regular password that I can remember. 
and that's all you have to do. Mm -hmm. It's really good. All right. So, uh, that is it for this episode. Thanks everybody who has watched live. If, uh, so the way we record this podcast and the way that it's uploaded is a little weird. I'm still working on a, on a good solution for it. So, uh, if you have a suggestion, I I'd love to hear it. So the way it works right now is we record this live every Thursday around three o'clock Eastern time, 2 PM central. Uh, outside of those time zones, you'll have to do the math yourself because that's way beyond me. Um, so if you want to live, watch live, you can do so at the Linuxcast uh, at youtube.com slash Linuxcast. Uh, usually we go live around 3, 3.15-ish, and then we bullshit for about 15 minutes, and then we start recording. And then we're here for any amount of time, depending on how long we actually, you know, uh, bullshit for. So, uh, in, in this case, we're here at five o'clock in the fucking afternoon. It's been going on for two hours. <laughs> and like I said, I'm ready to get out of this chair. Uh, but anyways, if you want to go through and watch this live, you can do so. Uh, once the pod, once we're done recording, I immediately make the recording unlisted. So if you, if, uh, you want to watch it live, you have to watch it live. Unfortunately, I'm one of those OCD guys that I can't stand when my views are split in two. So uh, people who watch it live don't often go through and watch the one that I upload on Friday. So a lot of times the views are split. It's a stupid thing that gets in my brain. I can't help it. It's just the way it is. So the the, the live broadcast is almost always unlisted. I don't delete it. So if you're, you're watching like midway through, you can just keep going. It's not going to go away. It's just it can't be searched by the algorithm. So on Fridays, then we up, I upload the actual podcast to both audio and video, and I've edited those things and made it sound as good as I can make it anyways. So uh, if you don't catch us live, you can get it through download or through YouTube on Fridays. So uh, before I go, let's take a moment to thank my current patrons. I'm glad I remembered to do that. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I can't go through and show the screen on screen because I didn't set up that scene because I'm a dumbass. So um, wow. thanks to all of my patrons. I don't have your names memorized. The, uh, I used to when there was like like six of you. I remembered all six names. But once you get past that, the memory, like I, the RAM in my head is just used. It's like an Amiga up there. I don't have very much RAM up there. So uh, <laughs> thanks to all of my subscribers. Uh, for or all my patrons for being patrons. You guys are all awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, Crazy Chicken has a question real quick. Are you going to try Magic for Emacs? I don't know what that is. Probably not. I have a video coming up on Emacs probably towards the end of the week. Um, I'm going to put this out there right now. The people who love Emacs are not going to love that video. So, um, spoiler alert. Uh, I'm sure that doesn't surprise anybody. So, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>